Well, this morning we are beginning part number two of the book of Revelation, and uh, I'm excited about that. We want to welcome all of you that are watching via the tab Facebook page and on our YouTube channel this morning as well. And last Sunday we, we covered the introduction, we kind of laid the foundation uh, for our study. We answered 12 questions. Remember those 12 questions? Everybody nod your head. Yes, Pastor, we remember those, those 12 questions. Uh, just to kind of um, uh, show uh, kind of where we're going and a little bit more about the back history to the book of Revelation. If you have not seen uh, or watched that message, please do so. It's archived for you on our tab page, and that will kind of make some sense. And, and the feedback I received even after the service last week and on through this past week uh, was that it helped uh, a lot of people understand uh, specifically the overview uh, and outline of the book of Revelation, which I want to uh, again remind us of, because if we don't understand the outline, remember, of the book of Revelation, how it's literally laid out chronologically from beginning to end, it can be a very confusing and perplexing book because there are lots of metaphors, there's lots of similes, there's lots of images, and, and let's just say uh, flat out mystery, right, to the book of Revelation, which is why, of course, a lot of pastors and a lot of preachers and teachers uh, and Christians themselves don't read the book of Revelation because it's so confusing. But it was never intended to be uh, such. And, and once we understand the outline, uh, the outline for us cracks the code. It helps us understand uh, what the message is all about and specifically the timeline of events. Because uh, as we saw last week, if we don't understand the outline and the timeline, then things are taken out of context, okay? And lots of, um, how shall I say it, good-hearted people and preachers like myself have taken things out of context. And, and if you do that, it can, get, uh, it can get really weird. That's probably the best way I could say it. And we can we cannot discern the time and, uh, and the events that take place and kind of transpose those on current events, all right? So Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, the Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, remember we, we saw that last week, was the author, was told by Jesus, we're going to get to this later on today in the, in the message here, but he was told by Jesus to write, okay, that's his purpose. Jesus said to John, write this down. Well, what was he told to write down? He said, write, therefore, what you've seen, what is now, and what will take place later. John was told, write what you see, what is now, and what will take place later. That is the three-point outline that uh, Jesus gave to John to give to us of the, of the order and chronology of the book of Revelation, past, present, and future. Let's look at that real quick. The outline of the book of Revelation, past, deals with the person of Jesus, who Jesus is today, what you have seen. Now, that's what we're going to get to today. We're covering chapter one today, all right? We're going to talk about that. Uh, the second point of the outline is things present. We're going to talk about the things present, specifically, specifically the possession of Jesus, what is now next Sunday. So see, you got to come back. You got to come back. All right. I'm going to, I'm putting a, a hook in you. You got to come back to get, uh, to get the next message. We're going to talk about things present that are currently taking place uh, in the world and in the church. Those are covered in chapters two through three. Now in the book of, or in the 30 days of revelation, that's what you're going to be reading about this week. You're going to be reading uh, today, chapter one, and then beginning tomorrow, and all this next week, leading up to next Sunday, you're going to be reading chapters 2 through 3. So when we come in next Sunday, uh, when we teach about the seven churches, you're going to already know a lot about them. And I'm just going to kind of take us deeper in regards to the message. Now, so we're covering the first two points, past today, present next week. But it's going to take us, you know, a month and a half to cover the future. All right. The future is the program of Jesus. Notice chapters 4 through 22 of the book of Revelation, what will take place later, all right? What will take place later? Um, in other words, these events, the things that John was told to write down in chapters 4 through 22, please listen to this. Those of you watching online, lean in now. They haven't taken place yet. 
it's all future. So we can't take chapter 5 and try to bring it into chapter 2. We can't cha take chapter 17 and try to bring it into chapter 3. Does that make sense? It's all in the future. So uh, one of the things we talked about last Sunday in, uh, in the 12 questions uh, of Revelation was the genre. Remember the genre of Revelation is apocalyptic prophecy, which is, uh, which is this. It's, think about this. It's tomorrow's history today. Apocalyptic prophecy is like reading a history book. We all like history. History, when we think of history, what do we think? Okay, my wife's shaking her head. She doesn't like history. Uh, <laughs> well, bless her honesty, right? So, uh, so history is what? When we think of history, we think of things past, right? You know, whatever, World War I, World War II, right? The American Revolutionary War was in the past. That's history. Well, when we read the book of Revelation, um, the vast majority, chapters 4 through 22, is apocalyptic prophecy. It's future history revealed to us today. And the book of Revelation actually is defined as what? The book of unveiling, the book of revealing. The root word of Revelation is what? To reveal, to uncover. So it's kind of exciting to me, and I think to, to you it should be, that we get to know what's going to happen in the future and God wants us to know what's going to happen in the future, or He would have never what? He never would have told John to write it down. And so John, Jesus said, John, write these things down. Past, what you see. Present, what's going on right now. But He, he said to John, but write this down. There's a whole lot of things that are going to happen in the future, and I want you to know about them. In other words, we shouldn't be mystified or ignorant or confused or baffled by the book of Revelation. We shouldn't. And we won't be, by the way. Once we get through this study, the, the Holy Spirit's going to what? Lift the veil on our eyes of understanding and interpretation, and He's going to inspire us. And I believe, as my, my engine's getting turned up right now, uh, is to excite us. Because for you and for me, who worship the King of glory, who's strong and mighty, powerful, it's exciting because we're on the winning side. We're on the winning team. Now, me and my friend Rob Taylor, we've been on some losing teams together, and we've been on some winning teams together. We've been on some state championship teams together. And I don't know about you, but I know about Rob and me, I like to be on the winning team. <laughs> I don't like to lose, do I, wife? No, no, no. no. I, I just, you give me an op option A to win, option B to lose, I'm going to take option A, right? So how many of you want to be on the winning team? How many of you be, want to be on the winning side? All right, I got half the church. All right, we're going to pray for the salvation of the rest of you. All right. <laughs> but we're on the winning team. We're on the winning side. So when we read the book of Revelation, we study it beginning again today, the 30 days of Revelation. It should what? It should not uh, fill us with fear, but it should fill us with hope, with confidence, with the blessed assurance and peace and rest that we're what? We're, we're, we're on the winning side. We're on the winning team. We have, we have Jesus, think about it this way, if we're talking to use the team analogy, He's our captain, right? Captain Jesus, right? And we're just on His team. And it's a winning team. And, uh, and so it's good news. And I cannot wait. It's going to be a great, great study. So that's the outline. So did everybody understand that? So when we read the book of Revelation together over the next 30 days, we're reading of things past, present, and future. And we're going to get to those. And I'm going to explain to you, again, current events, things that are happening right now, and future events that are yet to take place. Future history that is yet to be made, to be, to be made uh, known. All right? Very good. Well, let's, let's dive into that first point on the outline, things past, that John the Apostle was told to write down what he has seen. Chapter 1, here it is today. John begins with what I like to call the prologue. You got your message outline with you today, your message notes? Okay. I've broken chapter 1 down into a number of different kind of subtitles, sub, subcategories for us to understand it. John begins with the prologue. We would, saw, we would say maybe the prelude, the introduction to the book, all right? Revelation 1, verses 1 through 2 says this, The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him, to show his servants what must soon take place. 
He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, the prologue that John is giving us is the introduction to the book, and he says, hey, the whole purpose of the book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not about the Antichrist. It's not about the beast. It's not about the false prophet. It's not about the, the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls of uh, God's judgment upon the earth. It's not about the battle of Armageddon. It's not about receiving the mark of the beast or the chip in your hand. Although we're going to get to all that stuff. The theme of Revelation is who? Jesus. Jesus, again, stands front and center stage to all that's going on that we're going to be reading about over, over the next few, uh, few months and few weeks. So he's testifying, I love it, to everything he what, saw and heard and observed, like a key witness in a court case, right? The, the court brings in key witnesses to the accident or the crime, and they, they you know, swear, swear to tell the whole truth, all truth, nothing but the truth. So help them God. At least I think they used to swear about, you know, put their hand on the Bible. Yeah, well, John's doing that. John's giving testimony. John's giving witness to what? To everything he saw and was privy to, watch this now, past, present, and future, right? And then he writes it down for us to know and record and to be enlightened and educated about in his book, in his book, the book of Revelation. All right, then he goes into uh, the Apostle John gives us the blessing of Revelation. We talked about this last week, but I want to just hit it again because it's so good. Revelation 1, verse 3, John says, Blessed is the one, or he writes down, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Prophecy, again, things yet to come. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because what? The time is near. Luke eleven twenty eight 28 says, Blessed are those who hear the Word of God and what? Obey it. So there's three blessings to uh, the book of Revelation. I want to talk about these real quickly as we, uh, as we just kind of do a quick review of the blessing last week. Blessing number one, according to Revelation 1-3, comes to those who what? Read the book of Revelation. Woo! Here it is, people, right here. 30 days of Revelation. You're going to be blessed. I'm going to be blessed. You online, you're going to be blessed. You got to get a copy now. You got to get a copy what of the 30 days of Revelation because blessed are those who what? Who read the book of Revelation. Now, isn't it interesting? Listen to this. Lean in. Isn't it interesting how the devil doesn't want us to read the book of Revelation? He has convinced most Christians it's too hard to read, too confusing, too mysterious. Most Christians, they'll read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They'll read the book of, you know, Romans and Acts. But most Christians, at least that I've met, the majority, now some have, but the majority of Christians have never read the book of Revelation. Why is that? The devil doesn't want you to read the book of Revelation. Why? Because if you read it, you'll get blessed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, let's just put it in the devil's face. Amen. Let's just get it out and read it. And I've broken it down into bite-sized pieces. All right. For you and I, actually, I think on average, all you're going to do is read 10 verses a day. That'll take you, even if you're a slow reader, five minutes. How many of you got five minutes for Jesus this week? Five minutes to read, right? If you don't, again, we'll pray for you at the end of the service. All right, so, so, all right, for you to reprioritize your life, you're out of balance if you don't have five minutes to read your word, right? Read the word of God. So read the word. Why? Because you'll be blessed if you do. The Lord will meet with you. I promise you. I promise you. And blessed are those who hear it. You didn't know by coming to church and, and me preaching on the book of Revelation, you're blessed. You're receiving a blessing today. And all of us, what, are blessed for those who, what, obey it, do what it says, do what it says, and apply it to our lives. A threefold blessing of Revelation. Read it, hear it, apply it, and obey it. And as we do that, the blessing of the Lord comes into our lives. Now, the Apostle John next goes on to talk about the audience. Who was the book of Revelation written for? That's a very, very, very important question, right? Revelation 1, uh, verses 4 through 6, tells us who the intended audience uh, was and is intended to be. He says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who was, who is, and who is to come. 
and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever and ever. So the audience, the, the audience that the book of Revelation was written for was the church, was you, was me, was Christians over the past 2,000 years. Now, obviously, chapters 2 and 3 that we're going to read this, this next week and we're going to talk about next Sunday, there are seven specific churches that Jesus uh, told John to write specific messages uh, to, and we're going to look at those next week. But it wasn't just to the seven churches of Asia. It was to the church of Jesus Christ around the world. So the book of Revelation is written for you. It's written for me. It's written for you watching online today. It's written for us all. In other words, the book of Revelation wasn't just written for pastors. It wasn't just written for Sunday school teachers, right? It, the book of Revelation and its message is intended for us all, right? And that's good news because the blessing's for us all, right? The blessing of Revelation is for us all. Now, again, the theme or the subject of Revelation is given in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. John says, Look, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. So the theme, the subject, is Jesus Christ. Specifically, as we'll see again when we talk about that third part, the future events that are taking place. Specifically, the return of Jesus Christ, the second coming of Jesus Christ to the earth, and the consummation of the age, and the establishment, listen for this, this is good stuff right in the midst of all the stuff we're going through right now, the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth, in other words, the rulership of God on earth. King Jesus, all the presidents and prime ministers that we have today, when he returns, they're all gone. It's King Jesus time. And he establishes the kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy. There will be no tyranny. There will be no anarchy. There will be none of this stuff that's going on. That's what's happening. Look, he's coming. He's coming. I think he's getting on his horse right now. Putting his, his feet in the stirrups. That's how close I think we are. We're on the winning side now. Remember that. We're on, we're, we win. We win, right? He's coming. And here's the thing. Every eye is going to see him. We talked about that. I think we did last week. Maybe not. But you know what? Think about this. This was written 2,000 years ago, right? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yeah, 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. Just, just, just so you know. 2,000 years ago. Uh, up until really, I want to say 100 years ago, that was impossible for that scripture to be fulfilled. Now, if they would have read the Revelation and just stopped right there, say, well, there's no way, there's no human possible way that when Jesus returns, every eye on the planet is going to see him. It's physically, technologically impossible. But not anymore. How many of you got these with you today? Right? Right like that? Yeah. And I mean, some of you are pretty quick with it. <laughs> you can go live. We're going live right now, right? Around the world. We're, we're going live right. Matter of fact, I, I, I might have messed us up. So, 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 so click us oh. back in. Okay, okay, yeah, I did. So, uh, so <laughs> how many of you have ever watched television? There's television cameras around the world. There's cell phones around the world. All the technology. Again, the stage is being set. Remember, I talked to you about the, the curtain still pulled, but the stage is being set for future events to unfold quickly, quickly. That verse is now possible. For every eye on planet Earth to see him because of the technology of television and cell phones. Boom. And I mean it will go viral in seconds. Every eye is going to see him. Every eye is going to see him. Every eye. Even those that don't believe in him are going to see him. Right? Yeah. And those who pierce, they're going to what? They're going to mourn. They're going to be sad. All those people who denied Jesus, hated on Jesus, disbelieved in Jesus, they're going to mourn, they're going to weep. Why? Because they're going to figure out in that moment they was on the losing team. Come on now, we cried some tears when we lost. How many of you ever lost a game before? Right? <laughs> right? 
<laughs> that's what that's about. The people that, that disbelieve, they're going to cry, they're going to weep, they're going to mourn, they're going to wail. Why? Because by that point it's too late. It's too late. The game's over. The window of salvation has been closed. And there's going to be great travail. Why? Because they're going to find out this book was true after all. Hallelujah. Don't get nervous, by the way. The devil's getting nervous. God's not nervous. You shouldn't be nervous. I'm not nervous. We, we've read the book. Or if you haven't read the book, you're going to read the book. Right? We win in the end. We win, 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 win. Hallelujah. And, uh, and the theme of Jesus Christ and His second coming and triumph over darkness, the devil, and evil is, uh, is soon on the horizon. John then gives us the identity of Jesus. Again, we're talking about things past. Revelation 1 verse 8, Jesus says to John, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come. Do you see that? Past, present, and future. Who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So Jesus is saying, listen, Alpha and Omega is what? The first letter and the last letter of the, of the Greek alphabet. How many of you have ever been a sorority, fraternity, you know, Greek letters? Alpha is the first letter. Omega is the, the, the last letter. Now, now, here's the thing. Please don't, don't misunderstand this. Jesus isn't just the beginning and the end. He's everything in between and a bag of chips. All right? He's everything. In, he's, he's it all. He's it all. Why? Because he's the theme. He's the subject. And he's identifying himself to John. Now, think about this. We talked about this last Sunday, but it's important that we know John was the beloved disciple of Jesus while he was on the earth. Remember that? He was the closest disciple to Jesus. If anybody knew who Jesus was, it was John. It was John. John knows things about Jesus no one else knew. That's why when you read his books, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation, you find out more about Jesus than any other writer because John was closest to Jesus, right? And, uh, and Jesus loved John more than any other. Now, Jesus loves everybody, right? Yeah, he does. He loves you. He loves me. But boy, I tell you what, he loves those that what? That press in and, and, and get to him. And that's what John was. John, John was so close. He was his shadow. Remember, we talked about that last week. Jesus probably couldn't go anywhere without John going with him, right? Because he loved him. And, and, and Jesus is identifying himself to John. Why is this? To show himself, again, who he truly is. And that is what? The exalted glorified, triumphant, and victorious King of kings and Lord of lords. All right? This is who He is, who He was and who He is, the identity of Jesus. Now, the setting of uh, the book of Revelation, Revelation 1, verse 9, Jesus says, I, John, your brother and companion in suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos, because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, the setting. Where was John when he received the book of Revelation? He was on the island of Patmos. Now, this wasn't some island in the Caribbean. This was a Roman imperial prison, like Alcatraz, right, that we talked about last week. And it wasn't just in the bay of uh, some port. It was 50 miles out. Off, uh, off into the Aegean Sea. You can visit it today. It was, it's, it's a, it, it's a, it was a prison. That's all it was. And he was dropped there. And so Jesus meets John in the prison, in the worst condition uh, that he ever could have been in. And that's encouraging for us because you know what? Sometimes we think that you know when we're going through a mess, when we're in a dark place, that God couldn't find us. No, God can find you. God, Jesus knew right where John was. Isn't that interesting? And Jesus came to John on the Isle of Patmos. How, that's encouraging to me today. I hope it is to you. That's the setting. The context, Revelation 1, 10 through 11, of the book of Revelation is this. On the Lord's day, John says, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write, there it is, the commandment, right? Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches. That's the audience of Revelation, right? To Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. We're going to talk about all seven of those churches next Sunday. You're going to be reading about them this week in the 30 days of Revelation. The context uh, of which John received the revelation of Jesus Christ and the end time events, I love this, was on the Lord's Day, that Sunday, the Lord's Day Sunday, the day that He was resurrected from the dead. That's why Christians 
go to church on Sunday morning because we're reminding ourselves every Sunday morning, the first day of the week, first morning of the week, of the first day of the week is when Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. And Jesus says, I was uh, on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's Day on Sunday, and I was in the Spirit. In other words, I was praising God. I was worshiping God. I was praying to God, right? When all of a sudden I heard behind me a loud voice and a trumpet. So he hears a voice, and we see what the voice said, right? But he hears a trumpet. Now, trumpets are very important. We're going to talk about trumpets uh, a little bit later in our series. But if you, if you study the Word of God, many times what precedes a message from God is a trumpet. Almost like a dignitary, you know. Uh, you know, people would come in, you know, before the king or the queen comes in the room, there would be a little a guy, a little servant with a trumpet, and he'd come into the room and go, doo, 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 right? And then, hear ye, hear ye, here comes king, you know, so-and-so, whatever, all right? And, and everybody would turn, right, and look and see. And so here's the thing. So trumpets, that's what happens. A lot of times, trumpets what announce the presence of a king and the message of the king. And John would have known that, right? So he hears a loud voice, he hears a trumpet, and it, I mean, now he, he, he thought he was by himself on the island. Now that would kind of spook you, right? You think you're all alone on prison, and man, a trumpet's blowing, and a voice is talking behind him over here, right? And he turns, as we'll see here, and the voice speaks to him. So it's, it's, it's symbolic. The trumpet is important because it's symbolic that God's getting, the King of Kings is getting ready to speak. And, that, and that's exactly what he did. Jesus told John to what? Write on a scroll. Write on a scroll. This is what he did. Now, it leads next to, oh, this is something glorious, the encounter of John with Jesus. Boy, this is, this, is, this is wonderful. Again, this is things past. Jesus is already exalted. He's already ascended. He's already tri triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. He turns around. Here's the trumpet. Here's the voice talking to him. Turns around to see the voice that was speaking to me, John says. And when I turned, are you ready for this, people? It's a good thing you're sitting down. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters, like the sound of Niagara Falls. If you've ever heard that, that's amazing. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. Woo! I mean, what an encounter! I mean, he's in, he's on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's Day, praising and worshiping God. Here's a loud voice, here's a trumpet, turns. And he sees the exalted, resurrected, glorified, triumphant, victorious King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, standing there. Can you imagine that? That'd kind of bless your socks off, right? And he describes him with great detail, right? Just like, you know, if you had to give testimony to what Pastor Tim's wearing today, you'd say, well, he's got black pants on again, his favorite color, got his black shoes on. Yeah, he's got that sunburnt face like he does every June, July, and August, right? His hairline keeps receding. He's got his two favorite rings on his. You could just got a green shirt on. You could describe me, couldn't you? If you had to, write it down with great detail. That's what John did. John just, he sees him and he what? He writes it down. He records what Jesus looks like. The exalted one. The exalted King of kings and Lord of lords. And gives this great encounter with Jesus. Can you imagine that? And again, this is the purpose of the whole book, 
Because Jesus is what? The, the main character. He's the subject. He's the theme. He's standing center stage in the book of Revelation. Now, what was the effect of this encounter? What was the effect upon John in seeing Jesus in all his might and glory and power? Well, this is very good. Revelation 1.17 tells us, he says, when I saw him, that's Jesus, right? When I saw Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now, let's pause right there. A lot of people wonder, you know, when we die, when we go to heaven, what's going to be the effect? What's going to be our response when we, when we see Jesus like John did? Well, my hunch is, my hunch is this, is we're going to do exactly what John did. You're going to bite the dust. You are going to, I am going to fall on his feet and I'm going to see the nail scars. Right? I'm just going to, I mean, it's going to be so overwhelming. We're just going to bite the dust because his, his presence is going to be so powerful, so amazing, so glorious, so beyond words and overwhelming. Right? That you just drop to your knees in awe, in wonder, in praise, in worship, and glorify. I mean, He's going to be standing right there in front of you and right there in front of me. Hallelujah. And John bit the dust. I mean, he just, whoa, as though, I mean, just overwhelmed with, with joy and gladness and jubilation. And why? Because you got to remember now who's writing this? John. John knew Jesus better than everybody. Right? And he was so overjoyed. So, I mean, just, oh. And he just fell at his feet in worship and praise and glory and adoration. That was the effect of coming into a God encounter, uh, an encounter with the resurrected, glorified, exalted Jesus Christ of Nazareth. When I saw him, John says, I, I bit the dust. <laughs> I just went down like a bag of potatoes. I fell at his feet as though dead. Now watch this. What was the effect uh, what, was John, what was John's reaction uh, and that effect upon Jesus? Watch this now. How did that affect Jesus? This is amazing to me. Watch this now. Jesus then placed his right hand, right? Because there he is on the ground. Placed his right hand on me, John says. And what did Jesus say to John? Do not be afraid. Fear not. Why? Because I'm going to tell you something. I, there have been times, and I know some of you have had times, in the presence of God that it was so powerful, so awesome, so glorious. And yes, you're filled with jubilation and joy that your heart can't explain. But there is a, there is a, there is a fear to it as well. Because you know that this one has the power to go poof, and you're gone. Does that make sense? I mean, there's, there's a, if you read about really God encounters, true God encounters, I mean, it, it shakes you with, with joy and with fear all at the same time. So I think this is what happened. John hears the voice, hears the trumpet, turns around, sees Jesus, right? Falls at his feet in joy and in fear, trembling. I think he was shaking with joy and fear at the same time. And just overwhelmed by the majesty and the glory of Jesus, right? And the first thing, the first thing that our Lord says to John is, is, don't fear. I love you. Don't be afraid. And he touches him. You know, what do parents do when their kids are afraid? You touch them. Hold them, right? Embrace them. And boy, what that touch must have meant to John that day, right? It's just, hey, it's all right. Don't be afraid. It's me, right? Your, 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 your Lord and Savior. That was the effect on John, and that was the effect on Jesus, that Jesus loved John enough, what? Not to let him remain in his fear, in his presence. Do not be afraid. Then Jesus, I think, it's not in here, so I'm not going to suppose it. I think, knowing the Lord, I think he probably picked him up, right? 
I think they, 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 they no doubt embrace. Again, it's not in the book, so I hate to say that, but just knowing what I would do, right? What John the Beloved would do, I think he'd just, oh, Lord, I'm so glad to see you, right? And Jesus then gives him the victory. And this is very important because where was John? John was in prison on the Alcatraz of the day, right? Jesus said to John, I'm the first and the last, again, the Alpha and the Omega. I am the living one. Isn't that good? I was dead, and now look, I am alive, hallelujah, forever and ever. So Jesus identifies himself as what? The resurrected King of kings, Lord of lords, glorified, exalted Christ of God. I'm alive. I was dead, but I'm alive. Look at me forever and ever. And watch this. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Hades is a, a, another word for hell. We would probably say hell. Some, tr some translations say hell instead of Hades. It's the same place. Tomato, tomato, potato, potato. Okay? So Jesus says, I hold the keys of death and hell. In other words, I've got the victory. I have the victory over death, and I have the victory over the grave, and I've got the victory over hell. In other words, I am what? I am who I said I am. I am alive. I'm well. Look at me. Touch me. Hear me. And I've got what? I have keys. Keys are what? Keys are powerful. Keys are used for access, right? We use keys to access cars, access our homes, access workplaces. Keys are powerful. They unlock and they lock, right? That's the purpose of a key, to unlock something and to lock something. And Jesus says, listen, I have the keys to unlock death and to close death. I have the keys to unlock hell and to lock hell. In other words, I am what? I am victorious over the enemy. I'm victorious over the devil and all his plans and purposes. It's the victory that is ours through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Then he gives us again the outline. We've looked at it, but I want to lay it down here. Revelation 1 verse 19, Jesus again says, write, John, I want you to write this down, what you've seen. What did he just see? He just saw the resurrected, exalted king. And it's who he was past. Because now again, remember, let me just kind of remember the timeline here. All right. Uh, we don't know the exact day, the exact year that Jesus was born. So therefore, we don't know the exact year that Jesus died, right? Some would suggest somewhere around 30 A.D. 30 A.D. is typically the year that many people believe around that Jesus, Jesus died. G, uh, so he died. Three days later was resurrected, right? Forty days appeared to his disciples. On the 40th day was ascended to heaven, right? Yes, Pastor Tim, that's right. That's the timeline. So around 30 A.D. was when Jesus was crucified, dead, buried, resurrected. Forty days later, appeared to over 500 disciples before his ascension to heaven. That was around 30 A.D., give or take a year or two. John received the book of Revelation, most historians say, around 90 A.D. So that was 60 years later, if my math is right. Right? Yeah, yeah. 30 to 90 is 60. So 60 years after the ascension of Jesus Christ is when John had this on the Isle of Patmos. And John was the last disciple of Jesus to die. 60 years after it. I mean, he hadn't seen Jesus, hadn't heard anything from Jesus for 60 years, right, before this. And he said, hey, write the things what? That have been past things present and things future. Again, that's the, that's the outline. Then he reveals, lastly, the mystery of Revelation and of the vision uh, to, uh, to John in Revelation 1, verse 20. It says this, Jesus said to John, remember the vision, the encounter of not just the exalted Christ, but of seven stars and seven golden lampstands. Remember that? Yes, Pastor Tim, we remember that. Okay, wonderful. The mystery, Jesus says to John, of the seven stars you see in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, 
And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Remember we talked about this last week, that there's lots of metaphors and images, symbols and similes throughout the book of Revelation. But that doesn't mean we don't understand it. So people will say, well, what does the seven stars stand for? What does the seven golden lampstands mean? Well, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. <laughs> there you go. See, it's, see, isn't that confusing? No. See, it's not meant to be. It's a revelation. It's an unveiling. It's an enlightenment. That God, in other words, Jesus wants us to understand the symbols. Jesus wants us to understand the metaphors, right? And the similes and the mystery. He says, here's the mystery. He even says it. Just to clarify with John, here's the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the seven angels. Now listen, again, this could kind of be confusing, but in the original language, the seven angels... Angelos means angels. We understand there are angels. Absolutely. But it's actually a mistranslation. It's messengers. All right. We would know the messengers of the seven churches today, those that speak on behalf of the Lord to the church, are pastors, prophets, evangelists, teachers, right? So it would actually read like this. The seven stars are the pastors or the messengers that I have over the seven churches and in the seven churches. And then the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So again, Jesus gives John the book of Revelation to give to who? The pastors and leaders of the churches to give to the churches the seven lampstands, right? So that we can understand that because God has a message that he wants to give to the church. That's the whole purpose of the book uh, and revelation of who Jesus is and future events that are about to, to, uh, to unveil and to be revealed in these last days. So, again, I wish it was more confusing. I wish it was harder to understand, but it's just not. Once you understand the outline, the mystery, and you read it, Jesus says, hey, listen, here is the mystery. I'm lifting the veil. I want you to write these things down. I have a message I want to give to my leaders and I want to give to the church. So that what? So that they're not uneducated, so they're not uh, confused in the dark about what is taking place past, what's taking place uh, present, and what's about to take place in the future. I want to reveal the mystery to you, John, to give to the churches so that we can what? So that we can understand the times in which you and I are living in. That includes you and I and every church, uh, really, over the last 2,000 years since John received the book of Revelation in the year A.D. 90. So that we might be what? Equipped, empowered, and enlightened, and literally infused with the presence, the power, the glory, the hope, and the majesty of our great God and King. Isn't this good news? Jesus said, John, write what you've seen. And that's what chapter one is. Chapter one is all about what John has seen. And it's, it's revealing who Jesus was in the past and obviously in the present and in the future as we'll see here over the next couple of weeks today. Well, I wanna close this morning with a very special invitation. You didn't know you were gonna receive a very special invitation but it is. It's probably the greatest invitation any person could ever receive. And that is this. I want to invite you to receive the King of Kings and Lord of Lords into your heart and life. I don't want you just to be here today or watch online and be filled with head knowledge about our Lord. That, that, that's not really even the purpose of the book of Revelation, or the Bible for that matter. The purpose of the Bible and the book of Revelation is for you and I to know the Lord, right? It's one thing to know about Him, right? I can know a lot about Abraham Lincoln. I do. I don't know everything about Abraham Lincoln, but I can know a lot about Abraham Lincoln, and you probably do too. But I don't know Abraham Lincoln. Never met the guy. Someday I will. 
<laughs> right? Yeah. But I don't know Abraham Lincoln. I can know a lot about him. And unfortunately, too many people know a lot about Jesus. But they don't know Jesus. I want to give you an invitation to know the Lord today. Personally. To have him speak to you just like John had him speak to you. As, as Lord and Master and best friend. So if you've never met Jesus, if you've never welcomed Jesus, invited Jesus to become the Lord and Savior of your life, to become your king, to become your master, to become your best friend, I want to give you that opportunity here today. Can we do that? I want to close with that, that great invitation to become a Christian, to become a Christ follower this morning. So that you, beginning today, when you read the book of Revelation over the next 30 days, it won't just be head knowledge. It'll be experiential knowledge where the Lord will speak to you and, and minister to you and, and stir your heart to go into deeper realms of glory and relationship with Him. Can we do that today? So if you're here today and you would say, Pastor Tim, I've never asked Jesus to, to come into my heart and life. I've never asked Him to be my Lord and Savior. I've never asked Jesus to forgive me my sins. I want to do that today. Will you help me? I certainly will, my friend. So if you would, would all of you just bow your heads with me? Let's pray a prayer. And let's pray to Jesus and let's ask Him to do exactly that. If you're here today and you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're watching online this morning and you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, simply pray this prayer out loud with me. And everybody here that has already prayed is going to pray it with you. We're not going to embarrass you in any way, shape, or form. We're here to support you in receiving the greatest gift you could ever receive, and that is Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I come before you this morning, a sinner in need of your grace. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart and life and be my Lord and Savior and help me get to know you better every day of my life and help me tell others about you every day of my life and help me live for you the rest of my life. I confess you today I receive you today. I welcome you today into my heart and life as my personal Lord and Savior. This I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.